closed uh, roadway. So please, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, just a simple case study. I'm going to go over kind of our uh, process for this, uh, for us, relatively kind of a different use of FDS. Um, first of all, we usually do. So just explaining kind of what we did and just an examples of results. I'm not going to go through all the details because it's not that interesting. It's more the process, I think. Um, so yeah, I did this with uh, Jason Floyd here and Mike Ferreira, which use RJ. Um, the background is uh, there's a, a partial enclosed roadway. Uh, we'll go over a fairly busy and large um, road with uh, six lanes in each direction um, but in a major metropolitan area. Uh, about 900 feet long, which is mentioned twice to make sure you're paying attention. Um, yeah, and there's a tunnel directly north of it, which is fully enclosed and then goes into this uh, partially enclosed roadway. Uh, I'm going to avoid specifics because uh, can't really mention where and what this is. So I'm sure somebody could figure out, but um, yeah, and. Uh, so there's a, to the east of the roadway, there's a river, so it's a fairly large open area where wind could come in and um, disturb the, the flow there. And then there's buildings on the other side, uh, creating further complications for the wind flow. Uh, here's sort of a picture of the FDS model down by the roadway. Uh, fairly coarse, we'll get to that later. Um, like I said, the concerns were raised uh, during the design of this um, this building, uh, so there will be buildings covering over the roadway, and they were worried that during stalled conditions on the road, there could be a significant buildup of carbon dioxide in the roadway, which could be dangerous for uh, for the drivers. And like I said, due to the river, there's significant influence of wind, and we were wondering whether the wind coming in from the river, coming over the buildings, and creating sort of a, a vortex around around the opening could uh, cause problems. Yeah, so see there's an acoustic wall also that's kind of eight, about eight foot tall, I think, blocking uh, blocking the side of the side of the opening and there's a pedestrian esplanade on the side. The Federal Highway Administration and the EPA set limits for um, pollutants or in this case uh, carbon monoxide levels. Uh, which allowed um, to kind of depend on the time you're looking at and what kind of area it is. And in this case, we went with a 15 minute average, which is originally for a tunnel. And this is not strictly a tunnel, uh, but we consider that a conservative, uh, conservative uh, metric. And that's 120 ppm over any 15 minute average uh, time. So even going at one mile an hour, a car would go through this whole roadway section in less than 15 minutes. So we felt that was, a, that was conservative enough. Like I said, the approach would be due to the high complexity of the interaction of the wind, several hundred cars which would each be putting out an amount of carbon dioxide and wind from different directions and the, the large urban, uh, urban area with the buildings in all directions. Uh, we use uh, FDS to predict carbon monoxide buildup and where, where there could be areas of concentrations and then compare this to the EPA criteria over a 15 minute average. To and also, as I mentioned there, the solution obviously would be to put in a, an exhaust system that would blow through the enclosed roadway and clear out the CO and that's what they would like to avoid and or want them to know what whether they needed that or not, and if so, how what the flow rate would have to be. So, set up a significant model, uh, maybe not large by some standards, but we thought it's pretty large, about 0.4 square kilometers. It's sort of a rectangle, so I think it's not quite uh, the same distance because since the tunnel is longer. Um, several city blocks, see the buildings there, and I believe the tallest are over 120 meters high. So we had, had to capture the, the flow over and around all these buildings to really capture how the wind would affect the flow in, in and around the roadway. Um, 
both upstream and downstream. Obviously, downstream of the wind is more important. So as we had wind from different directions, we would cut off the model since you don't have to model as much downstream as long as it doesn't affect what's further back. Uh, ended up with uh, slightly over 4 million cells, um, 0.5 meters to all the way up to 4.5 meters once you're up the higher, higher elevations or further away. Uh, if you ask why we chose that size, it's partially because we wanted it to be done this month. <laughs> also, because it, it gets pretty large in this case. Um, but so it's also fairly simple. There's no combustion. It's just a simple, you re we released CO, which we'll go to later. So it's ma mainly just the mixing and the flow around there. So it's, you don't have to do all the, the combustion process and all that. So you could get away with a slightly larger cell size. So this is the, slightly from the north. You see the little white and black boxes are the, are the cars on the road. And you have the enclosure there over the roadway with the buildings on the side. We looked at some wind data, which was done for a pedestrian study uh, by a, a third party consulting firm. So they have uh, combined some wind roses here from surrounding uh, locations. We mainly use this to decide on which would be the most important directions to look at, combined with obviously the which direction the roadway faces, and also the kind of the velocities that we can expect to see in summer or winter. So we did a, a lot of uh, scoping runs in this case, uh, looking at wind from, like I said, several directions and several velocities from zero to 10 meters per second. And um, I think we set on about four, four major directions. Here you see the wind coming in from the east, blowing straight into the opening and you see the vortices around the buildings and uh, areas of high and low velocities. And also we looked at, like I said earlier, the other one where the wind comes in from the other side and create a vortex around the, over the river there. Uh, same figure, just different, uh, different view. Um, these preliminary scoping runs um, show that the lower speed resulted in general higher concentration inside the roadway, which a certain amount of sense if the wind velocity is really high will serve to just push the exhaust out. And where there's no wind, it would kind of dissipate on its own. But if you have a low velocity, it can create pockets where it's built up. And we also looked at summer and winter temperatures. I think somewhere around 30 Celsius and zero Celsius. Um, and found little difference uh, in the different uh, with those two temperatures, which also makes a certain amount of sense. It, uh, I believe the exhaust came out at 300 Celsius, so a difference of 30 C isn't going to make uh, a big difference in the buoyancy. So, having we have a fairly large clusters, so we could run several of these scoping runs concurrently, and then look at them as they were going and evaluate what we need to look at further. The traffic conditions uh, was another assumption we had to make. Um, like I said, uh, six lanes. Uh, we looked at a pretty severe case. We assumed stalled traffic in both directions, which in a metropolitan area could be one in the morning, one in the evening. But um, we chose to assume they're all stalled. Um, uh, about two feet between the cars, you know, bumper to bumper traffic, and a mix of uh, sedans and SUVs. There were no, thankfully, I should say. No large trucks are allowed here. Um, for the Brits, that's lorries. Um, so that certainly helped with uh, the exhaust, the amount of exhaust. And here's an FDS view of the carbon dioxide flowing out the, the opening there from the other corner, uh, the real red corner is the exhaust pipe, which is obviously much larger, but the amount is the same. Um, yeah, the EPA. Uh, has a emission factor for how many grams per uh, per mile, which I can uh, boil that down to how much comes out of each vehicle, and then for all six lanes, this was something that came from uh, the consulting firms uh, or the designer. Um, for simplicity, we assumed the exhaust was only CO and air. We didn't deal with any of the other uh, species in there. 
just a simple calc to uh, find our, uh, how much the amount coming out of the exhaust pipe, about half a gallon per hour when the car is idling, or about two liters per hour. And uh, then did the calc for the um, gasoline combustion and then find 5.8 grams per second is total coming out. And this is uh, put into FDS as a mass fraction of CO, mass fraction of uh, just clean air coming out. Like I said, it's about 300 C. Um, so uh, this is just an overview table of kind of this kind of summary we ended up with. Uh, the details aren't, aren't that important here, but just giving you an idea what we we pulled out here after a uh, final runs. It says different temperatures, but you can see it's only the summer temperature. Like I said, there's we didn't find a big difference, so we ended up going with that. I think that was slightly worse, but only by a few ppm, so probably not that important. But we looked at different wind conditions and the wind velocities, and we looked at the 15 minute average. Um, um, maximum CO levels. This is in any place in the tunnel. It's not just measured point-wise. We looked at a slice, I'll show later. So we could see um, much in every area. Did not exceed 120 ppm. In fact, the highest is the wind from the northeast, which gives uh, less than 50 ppm. So it's never really any problem approaching the limit. And like I said, in general, we can see the, the wind from the eastward, from the river side is where the, the highest uh, the highest concentrations occur, the wind coming up from the south or from the other side were uh, better results. And the calm, no wind was also a, a better as kind of a, a baseline scenario. Like I said, this is kind of the main thing we, um, we looked at was the slice file uh, about uh, one and a half meters over the roadway, just a slice of uh, concentrations of carbon monoxide See the red there, this is a scale up to 40 ppm, so still way below the, the limit we were looking for. But um, I believe this is from the wind from the river side, uh, from the top in this figure. And you see there's a concentration up there in the, the northern end of the, <coughs> the roadway. It's, uh, it's a bit of a merge of a 3D CAD and the slice uh, FDS output, so not the most attractive, but it's kind of the best we can do. I'm sure it would look much better if you just pyrosim. Um, I agree. Um, so yeah, that's, and this is, like I said, this is an average over 15 minutes. So it's a 900 second average to really get rid of some of those local fluctuations. And also, since the criteria was a 15 minute average, um, this gave us a much better idea than otherwise it would jump around a lot. Other results we used. Uh, more uh, earlier in the um, simulation was to look at uh, the velocity vectors. Here the wind is coming from the south. We can see that it's pushing the, go flowing nicely through the roadway and out the side. So it's gonna push the, the vehicle exhaust out. So that's why it doesn't create any problems. And we can also see if there was local, local problems where we had vortices inside. Um, I see that it's mostly used to find the worst case scenarios uh, for further study. There was at one point that was a little back and forth, but this acoustic walls, we ran cases both with and without. As you can see here, we're looking at a slice through the roadway, uh, looking at the velocities. They're always finding kind of hard to see these little arrows in smoke view, but that's the way they are. Um, so we can see here the wind coming in from the, from the river, hitting this wall and creating a vortex, and you have only one directional flow in, which obviously is what results in this buildup of carbon monoxide. Without the wall there, we saw lower concentrations because you got this bi-directional flow where it would recycle the, the air back out. Um, but the wall was going up, so that's what we ended up running. Um, so this uh, conclusion, it was a, a pretty, pretty complex system where we have to have the interaction of both the vehicles, the exhaust, the wind, and um, all the large buildings in both ends, especially the two tall buildings at each end of the roadway. 
which disrupted the wind. Um, so we used an FDS model, to, um, a large FDS model to get, um, to figure this out. We could run multiple wind scenarios simultaneously to really kind of break down what, which ones were the worst, what we had to look at further. So that definitely helped. Yeah, like I said, we the mandated CO2 concentration limits were not exceeded, so they could avoid the cost of uh, installing additional ventilation. Um, yeah, I think that's so. Any questions other than how to make this fantastic graphic? <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Suspect uh, the effect of uh, relative humidity uh, on the model. That's not really something we looked at, so it's a good question. I uh, I would imagine it would somewhat uh, depend on the temperature we had, but that's a parameter you can change. But we didn't definitely definitely didn't look at that, so I, I couldn't tell you to be honest. Um, but like I said, the the CO coming out is a very high temperature already, so I think that that would be driving the buoyancy more than other things. But Thank you for the interesting yeah. uh, presentation. Um, on further to uh, the question that was just asked, can you give, give some information about how you treated uh, uncertainty and also uh, validation for, for the application that you used F FDS? Like I said, it's a, it's a fairly simple case. It's just the gas mixing. Um, we have the issue here that we it's a large model. It takes over two weeks to run. So yeah, we would have liked to run several more parameters, like you say, but uh, it's somewhat limited. But so we were mainly just looking at the results and seeing that it made a certain amount of sense. And there are like said, uh, just gas mixing it's validated, but I'm not sure I can <laughs> answer you better than that. But yeah, maybe Jason wants to. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, obviously, you know, given the sort of the time frames you're always trying to run these things on with half meter grids, you'd be you'd have some concern about you know you know numerical effects on diffusion and things of that nature. Um, but you know, I think the, the, the point to recall is that the highest CO we saw was over a factor of two below the limit. So you know, even if you account for, you know, okay, we've got some uncertainties in vehicle exhaust and there's probably some diffusion effects, we're extremely far below the regulatory limit. And so that you know, it gives you some confidence that our conclusion is, is, the, is the correct conclusion. If we were sitting up with the result around 100 ppm, I mean, yeah, we, we would have said, no, this is it's too close to the limit, but we were we were well well below you know, the regulatory limit. Yeah, they also used fairly conservative numbers for both the uh, the release of CO and all the number of cars and all that. There's pretty severe uh, conservatism baked into that. So, uh, yeah. I, I might have missed it, but you said it ran for about 15 minutes. The Entire simulation? We ran it for 20 to 30 minutes, I think, and then we took a 50 minute average at a certain, certain point in. Because you gotta remember, this is a, this is a steady state, because the wind is constant and the CO release is constant, so it's gonna stabilize fairly quickly. So we just needed that 15 minute average, so we let, which we took a few minutes in, so it let it stabilize, then take a 50 minute average. Okay, you actually answered my second part. I was wondering if it stabilized or if it was still increasing and you just stopped at a certain no. point. No, okay. like I said, yeah. It, it both those are constants so within a few seconds, really, or as long as <laughs> it would take time to take the wind to get across, that's pretty much when it stabilizes. But we gave it, a, I think, five minutes in or something. So yeah, 20, 25 minutes. And it was, everything was stable after that point. So we could have let this run for two hours. We've got the same results. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.